So this is uh, some work that, I, that I've done with, uh, with Bruce uh, and Micah, and um, I very much would, um, would love to hear uh, feedback from, from you guys in, in the wider analogy community um, as, as we progress with it. So the context of this, uh, as a lot of uh, an analogy and analogical reasoning uh, work uh, context starts off with is the is kind of the the purported use of um, of analogies in the real world and in in scientific discoveries. You know the the famous uh, Velcro by analogy to burdock burrs and. The development of the Rutherford Ball model of uh, by analogy to the solar system. There's uh, Claude, Claude Shannon's development of the computer chip uh, by drawing analogy between Boolean logic and circuit boards. There's all these examples of uh, analogies in uh, in both popular and scientific uh, history that all have this kind of exciting element of uh, of a far uh, of a far flung leap between contexts and, uh, and domains uh, or what Dunbar um, called uh, long distance analogies in his taxonomy. So uh, this is this is um, this kind of transfer and this kind of retrieval is uh, supposedly at least to some extent driven by schema induction which is the um, which is the highlighting and extracting of underlying principles and relations um, usually Due to some kind of uh, well, sometimes due to, uh, to analogical comparison, but it's this extracting of underlying relational structures um, that's that's the key here that leads to uh, facilitating retrieval and transfer as well. And so, and a lot of this work was done, of course, by Gettner and colleagues. And the the focal article that we were responding with this uh, this kind of work was the 2009 paper. Uh, in which they uh, got people to encode source material at time at time point one, and after some uh, some time, roughly thirty minutes, they got them to do some comparisons between material that was also an analogous, and they found that when uh, people compared stories, oh, in that case, there were. Uh, examples of negotiations that had the same underlying principle and, and relational structure, they were more able, they were uh, more likely to retrieve or tell, say that it reminds them of the source material that was uh, in fact uh, analogous. Um, uh, that was made to be analogous by the experimenters. And so that's kind of the the context of this work. And what uh, one thing that struck us was that this that this work was mostly this work and a lot of other work on retrieval is mostly done with uh, narrative to narrative retrieval or transfer for that matter as well. And whereas, uh, as I said before, supposedly we uh, we've been captivated by this uh, longer distance analogical retrieval in other uh, in other scenarios. So that's one thing that we wanted to address. And second, there's been kind of uh, the, the focus in relational structures has mostly been first order, you know, uh, surface versus, um, versus uh, first order relations. Whereas um, we kind of wanted to focus a little bit more on uh, all three of these levels and see if there's any differences um in in their influence and so that's kind of what we did in, the, in this work looked at long distance analogical retrieval uh, retrieval across uh domains that are further just from uh one story to another story and the kind of semantic differences there something even something even if, uh, further out in the past has been uh, some work being done with um, uh, mathematical transfer between uh, narratives and, and mathematics as well. And so we kind of wanted to uh, piggyback off that and, and really look at this longer distance retrieval. And we used uh, written narratives like have been done in the past and more abstract representations in using uh, letter strings and, and shapes. 
And secondly, we looked at multiple levels of abstraction, surface first order and higher order relations. So to kind of summarize the, the difference between our, this work and, and Gettner's uh, paper, and Gettner et al's paper, is that so in this, though the previous work used stories as the initial encoding stage, and then a comparison between narratives or stories in the retrieval phase, this long distance, when we say long distance retrieval, we mean a retrieval of one domain, in this case, narrative from some other domain, which in this case was letter strings in more in a more symbolic form. So I'll now describe one of the experiments that we worked on. Uh, we did three uh, in this uh, in the series, and I'm going to be describing the, the final one uh, because there's a little bit of material development along the way. And uh, this one's the more robust uh, one in terms of sample size and in terms of um, being closest to the um, uh, comparison to the Gettner work. But I'm happy to to talk on any of the other ones if um, if anyone is interested. So we used a uh, an online sample uh, from Mechanical Turk, and we split people up into three between subject conditions based on the three different levels of abstraction that we were using. So uh, surface, first order, relational, and higher order. And these corresponded to the kinds of schema induction that we expected them to do, or the kind of principles that we expected them to be uh, extracting. And I will uh, explain that using more explicit materials in a moment. So as I mentioned, as I alluded to before, participants first read a bunch of stories, seven in total. Three of them were the so-called target ones, which included the, the uh, story about uh, that um, whose uh, principle was um, uh, was a kind of more surface, um, uh, more surface, uh, whereas the other two were more relational, first order and high order, and then four of them were kind of filler stories that didn't necessarily have to do with the others. Then they did a filler task for 30 minutes, just like in the Gettner task. And then the key part, and this is where the between subject uh, allocation came, uh, came into, uh, they made a, a comparison between two symbolic representations of letter strings and symbols, plus uh, were given an, an explicit principle as well to, um, to encapsulate what uh, encapsulate that comparison. They were then asked to retrieve one of the stories that they had before. Which story does this best remind you of? This does this most remind you of? So I'll I'll just pause it for a moment and just see if anyone has any clarifications about the procedure before I move on to the actual materials and some examples of what uh, participants saw. So the only, yeah, the only questions I've got really are about some of these task materials, but I think you're going to talk about those, did you say? So it'd be yeah, interesting that's right. to know explicitly what the difference between a first order and a, and a higher order kind of. Sure. So, uh, so I'll, I'll talk through that now. Um, and, uh, and I guess I am assuming a little bit of, um, uh, a, a bit of kind of knowledge of uh, kind of the basic analogy stuff, which I think is uh, fine for this crowd, but I'll give some specific um, examples as well um, to what I mean by that. So, okay, so here is an example uh, or some some extracts from the story that uh, uh, that was created to be uh, to have an underlying surface um, schema, which is kind of weird to say because you know surface. Uh, it's weird to say surface principle, but anyway, you'll you'll uh, you'll see what I mean. So this is a story of John, who's uh, who uh, printed out some flyers for, to do some marketing for his company, and uh, there was a typo in the materials, so he changed the uh, 
the, the letter E to the letter F uh, in, the, in the material. Very simple. Uh, it's a little bit longer, but it was, you know, it's just like a paragraph. Sorry, it wasn't a very long one. As for the kind of the first order relational story, this was a story about uh, someone who was an advisor to a king, and there was uh, there's a, uh, a succession to the throne, and um, one daughter who was meant to be there ran away, and then so he had to work out who's the next person. Well, how did he do it? He had to think who the next person in the in the six in the uh, to the throne would be. So the idea here was um, that the key thing, the key part of this was the element of succession. Um, you, you start with one component and then you move on to the next one in the sequence. Whereas here, the surface story was the emphasis was on this change from the letter E to the letter F. The higher order story was this one. So Julia is a manager at a local uh, information center. And she's trying to manage her staff based on the demand of customers. And she's worked out that for some reason, uh, this, uh, the, um, the demand increases uh, consistently throughout the week. And so she doesn't want to understaff or overstaff um, uh, over the week. So she decides to staff uh, with, increase, with a monotonic increase throughout the, the week. So the key thing there is so one staff member on Monday, the start of the week, two on Tuesday, and so on. Uh, so on Sunday, she will have seven uh, staff members. So the key thing here was this connection between the, uh, the numerical sequence and the quantity. The numerical representation of the number uh, of uh, the, the, the sequence of the, the day in the week and the quantity, the representation of quantity, number of staff members, which corresponded here. So these were the three kind of focal uh, or target stories. And then there were four others that were uh, less related. I won't go through them now. What I'm gonna do now is go through the, 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 the kind of the second half um, of the experiment, which was the schema induction component. Everyone read the same stories, but they had a different display or schema induction display in front of them. And so now I'm going to share the, what this kind of looked like for each of these um, uh, each of these conditions and how and explain how they would cor supposedly correspond to these stories. They didn't look exactly like this, but they the information was the same. So here's an example of the display for the um, the uh, surface uh, the surface schema condition on the left hand side you see the uh, the, uh, the comparison between two analogies which are um, which are kind of standard um, standard ones that have been used in the past on the left right hand side you see uh, the kind of explicit principle that was um, shared with the participant alongside this comparison. And so what you see here is that on the left-hand side, you have an analogy, uh, you have a, a GHE is to GHF as, uh, and then it's got a, you know, it's got some shapes, but the point is, is that the E and the F also change. So the pentagon and the hexagon are the same, just as the G and the H are the same, and then it's quite clear that that's what changes. And so the key thing here uh, was that, uh, that even though the, even though this could be construed in, in many different ways, when it's compared to another analogy, uh, in, a, in a kind of a similar form, but slightly different, really you see that the main thing that's in common between both of these is the change from the letter E to the letter F. There's no indication that uh, there's any other change. There's no, there's no other reason to assume that there is uh, um, any other importance for these other letters. And that really, and the kind of the, the explicit principle drives that home as well. 
that's the example of what they, the participants saw in the surface schema condition. Any question on the on the surface one so far? Cool. Oh, let's see, maybe Maria is unmuted. Maybe not. Okay. Um, so the so this is the uh, what they saw in the first order relational um, uh, condition. So you see the starting of the the start of the analogy is the same. I made sure that the the first component was always the same uh, for each of the um, for each of the conditions, but the subsequent two components uh, were the difference. So here we see. A bunch of a bunch more shapes and a bunch more letters on the bottom. And so this is meant to be expressing the concept of succession, as was in the second story. E changes to F not because uh, we're changing that uh, that typographical orthographical uh, orthographic form to this other one, but it's specifically changed because of its succession in the same way that a triangle might change to a square because of the increased number of sides. Uh, the number of the, the shapes is, is relevant because of uh, what uh, we're doing in the higher order condition, um, which I'll show you in a second. But the point is, is that the number of shapes and the number of letters stay the same between each version. So it's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. The number of letters uh, of shapes doesn't matter. It's just the the fact that we're changing from a triangle to a square, and from a J to a K, and from the E to an F, and from a G to an H. They're all moving one um, one up in their uh, sequence. Uh, any questions on this this display on the first order relational? Cool. And so I guess you should already you can probably already see that the idea was that the principle they extract from the, uh, the surface schema condition is meant to map onto that initial story about the typographical error, where he just changes the E to F. Here, there's a little bit of an increase in, in, in abstraction, and it's, it's about the principle of succession, just like in the, in the second story. And then this is the display that those who are in the higher order condition saw. So you see it's very, very similar to the, uh, the, the previous one, uh, which, which is on purpose so that we can, uh, so we can control for as much as possible. But of course, the difference here is that we now have uh, one more shape. And so what you notice if you have a look is that the number of these shapes correspond to the, uh, these letters in the alphabet. So G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. There's seven, seven shapes. And then H is the eighth letter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight shapes. E is the fifth letter. So there's five triangles there. And so when we move from E to the F, we increase the number of shapes by one. And of course, so what this is, uh, the idea here is to extract that, that high order principle of connection between uh, numerical representation and order representation. <clears throat> and this is seen as well here in this, um, in this display uh, down here where the letters stay the same, all that changes is the number um, the number of uh, letters in the second half, in the second part of the uh, analogy relative to the sequence or the, the order of the, these letters in the alphabet. And so, and that's explained here on the right-hand side. And of course, the idea is that this maps onto that third story where the manager is mapping the order of the days in the week to the sequence uh, to the quantity of the um of the staff members in the store and this is uh this is a higher order uh, uh relational structure because we're mapping uh these two first order relations one being the a quantity the quantity um 
of the uh, the change in quantity and the other one being the change in representation of um, of order in the sequence. So uh, questions on the higher order uh, display before I move on to uh, what we found. So, so the way we did the analysis was um, as a, a chi square cross tab because we uh, we we coded up where um, what condition well we coded up what uh, story they uh, they supposedly retrieved and uh, we used that to compare to what condition they were in and so we were looking at specifically the hypotheses the hypothesis that those who are in a certain condition would retrieve the target story that's related to their uh, that's uh, relevant to their condition more than they would um, uh, any other uh, more than they would any other um, story. So that's kind Sorry, of. Sorry, Yep. Yep. Can I just yep. yeah jump in and ask a question? Um, what were the the stories that the participants read at the start? Were they just told to read them? Were they told that they would be reading them for some particular reason or given any instructions on how they should read them at all? Or? So yeah, the, so I have specific instructions uh, off the top of my head. Uh, I don't have it top of my head, but I have the, the, uh, the materials in front of me. So I'll tell you exactly what, uh, what was said. So they were told uh, below us some short stories. Please read them thoroughly and make an effort to memorize them in as much detail as you can, as you will be tested on them later. When you are done, proceed to the next stage. Mm -hmm. And then they read these short stories. I can. I don't really want to flash them up because it's probably going to be too much. But um, the only other thing that they were asked to kind of get a get a bit of engagement with the story was what was the resolution to the problem in the story. So each of the stories had you know were in this. Uh, it wasn't really clear from the extracts, but it was kind of in this uh, structure of um, there's a setup, a, a problem, and a resolution. All right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So it was. It, they were told to make an effort to memorize, but not for any particular reason. Right. Cheers. And then the question at retrieval, the specific question was: uh, Think back to the stories you read earlier. Please recall the story that most reminds you of the simple strings that you just read on the previous page. Um, and there was a bit of, uh, you know, please describe is sufficient detail anyway. And then that's what I used to encourage them. Thanks. No worries. And so let me get back to where I was. Great. So, uh, so we did this comparison between the, for each retrieval, for each story retrieval, how many times did those in the in the relevant condition retrieve it versus how many did anyone else um, retrieve it? So, for instance, in the surface uh, for the surface uh, schema story, uh, thirteen out of uh, this was retrieved thirteen out of forty times, and in the, those and for those not in the surface schema condition, this is retrieved um, twenty eight percent of the time. Also, we found that. Uh, for the surface schema story retrieval, there was no significant difference in, in retrieval between uh, whether you were in the in the schema condition, in the, the relevant schema condition and, and the actual story you retrieved. And this was the same for the first order uh, schema story. There was no significant difference there. But we did find uh, a significant difference for the higher order uh, story retrieval. Which was uh, which was pleasantly surprising, uh, because that's that we expected that to be the kind of the toughest, and in fact, not many people did retrieve it, um, which makes it even clearer that uh, we see uh, we see an effect here of the schema induction uh, process or uh, procedure, and in fact, this was actually uh, replicate actually replicated the the, sub the previous experiment um, that we did. Uh, which found the same thing, and also found uh, the surface and the first order ones a bit equivocal, a bit more equivocal. And so this, of course, 
uh, this kind of finding uh, gives a good strong support for the schema induction accounts uh, that people are kind of encoding uh, a certain representation and it's as they go through life and it's not inert. Um, knowledge can be you know, reactivated, I guess, um, using schema induction at a later stage. And, of, and the main thing that uh, kind of drove this was that usually we've seen narrative to narrative analogies and this is uh, in the evidence that people are able to kind of link up more disparate uh, elements that we've expected previously and some uh, evidence that they're able to do that in uh, with a more difficult higher order uh, relation and so the the punchline is is that we can is that we have evidence for schema induction facilitating this long distance retrieval for higher order relations um, of course uh, the limitation was that we didn't see this lower uh, order relation effect and we're not sure if that's because of the uh, there were it was in, it didn't lead to sufficient kind of schema in the induction process or it's specific to the the content because we didn't um, we didn't vary the the content uh, we, you know it was, it was initially difficult enough to find the, an example for those kind of um, principles there but that would be something to look at in the future how dependent this is on the specific uh, materials. Uh, the other uh, question um, uh, people may have, I imagine, is the role of the explicit principle versus uh, the comparison itself. Um, and I guess the, the approach here was kind of a kitchen sink. And then, you know, in the future, we can uh, delineate what's there. But there is quite a bit of research, that, quite a bit of work on using schema induction alongside with explicit principle or uh, vice or just one or the other. And the finding is, is that usually have, merely having an explicit principle isn't enough to, for schema induction uh, for transfer or retrieval, uh, but it does facilitate the induction. And that's, um, that's been shown by um, a few key, uh, key works in the field. Uh, so basically what this is, this is to say that uh, we don't know what the role of the explicit principle is, but um, if this work is to go by, uh, it wouldn't have been enough uh, on its own. And the other uh, limitation, this is uh, kind of more, um, you know, just for more practical implications, it's, uh, this is fantastic for maybe educational um, uh, implications. You can help people extract principles and, and retrieve using uh, prepared materials. But of course, this is not something that you could do if you're trying to think of, a, if you're solving a, a question about uh, innovation or trying to be creative and so problem solving for the future because you don't know what the principle is that you're trying to find to then create the comparison. But of course, there's been a, quite a bit of work on this um, uh, about getting people to imagine um, comparisons and uh, imagine uh, uh, kind of schemas and, um, and also uh, um, uh, Ken Kurtz has done some cool work on kind of more active ways of encouraging schema induction. So I'm you know, keen to see more work on this in the future connected to this work. That's all for that. I really appreciate the time. Uh, there is a preprint up if anyone wants to have a look. And if, if you can't remember it, it's on my website. You can email me as well, tweet. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'd love to hear some feedback uh, from you all.